Welcome everyone. It's great to see so many of you. Uh, my name is Ida Marie Vam, and I'm a postdoc researcher at DEEPS. Uh, we really have been looking much forward to this webinar on what drives African migration and what role does development aid have to play. In the often heated European policy debates over migration, conflict and the lack of development are often described as the root causes that make people seek refuge and a better life in Europe, thus implying that targeted development aid can curb unwanted migration to Europe. However, recent research-based literature on the links between migration and development stands in stark contrast to such simplified assumptions. Our aim today is to unpack the complex relationship between migration and development and shed light on some of the main drivers of contemporary African migration and the implication for current development policy. We are in great company today. We have invited Jessica hagen Sanga, senior researcher at ODI. Her highly influential and policy relevant research focus on migration and development, migration decision making and the links between migration and social protection. And today she will talk about how are migration decisions affected by policy, drawing on key findings from the EU Horizon 2020 MICNEX program. We also have Leanda Candelige, researcher at the Center for Migration Studies, University of Ghana, that probably is one of the people that knows most about contemporary migration from Ghana and the country's migration policy. He will give us his perspective on local responses to the increased focus on addressing root causes of migration in development programs. And finally, we have Dr. Oliver Bakewell from University of Manchester, for many years, his crucial work has focused on the intersection between migration and mobility and processes of development and change in Africa. He is the research coordinator on the migration and development for research and evidence facility for the EU Trust Fund for Africa. And he will explore what we can learn from the Trust Fund in the Horn of Africa and the implica implications for development and migration agenda. Then we have our own researcher here at DEES, Nina Nyberg Sørensen, who is also with us from Ghana today. She will, in the light of her own research on the migration development nexus, reflect on the three papers. And finally, my colleague Lars Ingberg Petersen will moderate the debate. He and I, together with my colleagues, ha colleague Hans Lucht, have just published a policy brief and a working paper on this theme. I think you can see them on some links in the chat. Uh, they are commissioned by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and uh, they are available on our DEEPS website. So check them out after the seminar. I will now welcome you all and uh, give the screen to Jessica. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Um, thank you, Ida and to DEEPS for inviting me to contribute to this webinar. Um, it's great to be with so many other great researchers, and I look forward to um, discussing the issues. Okay, let's go in presentation mode. Yeah, good. Um, so my presentation today is going to focus on how migration decisions are affected by policies. And um, I'm going to reflect on the MIGNEX project, which I'll briefly introduce to you, um, but also beyond um, the MIGNEX project. Um, so the MIGNEX project is a Horizon 2020 funded project um, with the core ambition to create new knowledge on migration and development and policy. Um, so we want to contribute to a more effective and coherent migration management through an evidence-based understanding of the links between migration and development. So very much on the topic of today's webinar. Um, it's, and we started in 2018, we're, we're due to finish in two years time, but we basically lost um, a year um, because of COVID, um, but we've now caught up with our data collection. Um, we are eight core institutions, um, and Leander is actually also a member of the core MIGNEX research team. Um, 
So the geographical scope is um, we're very much focused on the research area level because we are interested in understanding the links between specific developments and, and migration. Um, so we are covering 26 research areas across 10 countries. Um, so today's presentations, um, we were asked to, as, as speakers, to um, consider two questions. So first of all, can development aid be used to curb unwanted migration? Um, but then also how potential migrants respond to European policy initiatives. And those policy initiatives, of course, often try to get people to stay in their home communities. So um, when I heard those questions, um, my, my first reflection was to think about um, the range of policy responses that um, uh, we've seen as a response to this perceived migration threat coming from, from Africa and, and other con continents. And um, one of those um, responses, policy responses has of course been to um, to address the so-called root causes of migration. Um, and um, in my presentation today, I want to actually think about how migration decisions are affected by policy. So the dynamics of actually encountering and um, e experiencing these policies. Um, so um, the, the presentation today partly draws on the MIGNEX project, but it also draws on a paper I wrote together with Richard Mallet. Um, so yeah, he, here's um, the link to, to those papers and actually also partially draws on a journal article um, with Heaven Crawley. So I'll put links to the publications in the chat afterwards. Okay, so migration and policy. Let's first have a think about how policy could potentially affect migration. Um, if we think about, um, if we picture migration decisions happening um, by, first of all, um, migration aspirations um, being formed and potential root causes influencing those migration aspirations, then migration aspirations potentially being realized into um, actual migration, um, then we policy could potentially influence um, migration in um, through several pathways. So first of all, it could um, affect um, um, the actual root causes. So for example, um, the, the, these policy entry points addressing the root causes have been very popular. So that could include, for example, livelihoods programming. Um, which would then the underlying thinking is that we have livelihoods programming and then people are not and less less um, worse off and then they no longer um, want to change um, change their lives and no longer want to migrate. Um, then um, another type of policy also very popular um, focuses on the formation of migration aspirations. Um, so it wants to deter from people considering migration as an option um, by telling people about the, the, the dangers associated with migration. Um, and, then, um, and then we also, of course, have a set of policies where um, it tries to, where policymakers try to stop people from, from migrating, so stopping them on their tracks when they're already on the way um, or, um, or have arrived at the um, so-called borders of Europe. So for example, a border fence. Um, and um, the underlying assumption is that as long as these policies are implemented well, um, they will have the desired effect of stopping migration. But um, do they? Um, there's a lot of evidence in, in this area. It's um, really mixed. Um, on the one hand, we have seen a significant reduction in numbers of people coming to Europe at various points in time. Um, and that reduction in numbers might be due to, to policies having an effect. Um, but at the same time, there's also a lot of evidence which um, 
shows that policies have all kinds of um, inadvertent or unexpected effects, sometimes seem to even lead to, to increases in, in migration aspirations or, or numbers. So what are some of the reasons that policies might fail to achieve their de desired effects? Um, so we know that, of course, migration is driven by a wide range of structural and societal factors. And often non-migration policies seem to be much more influential than migration policies. Um, so that's one explanation. Um, an explanation I'd like to focus on for the remainder of the presentation is um, the transformation of policy as it goes through um, the life cycle of policy. Um, so I'm going to build on some work which Matthias Czajka and Heide Haas um, published in 2013 where they disaggregated um, the, the, the policy process. Um, so they um, talked about how policy transforms when it moves from narratives around migration policy to the actual design and then implementation. Um, in the work I did with Richard Mallet, we focused on how people encounter their policies and engage with these policies downstream. So, do these policies actually change minds, do their auto-migration plans and redirect behavior? Um, so here you can see um, a framework. This is um, which shows the transformation of migration policy. Um, the gray parts of the framework are the ones which were in um, the Chaika and the Haas paper. So you can see how policy moves from the discourse to the actual design. So migration policy and paper and then implementation. And from each step, you can see potential gaps. And then they talk about the so-called efficacy gap, which is um, between implementation and migration outcomes. And then they say, this is where you can also have gaps. Um, so in our work, we try to kind of dig into that black box of um, the efficacy gap, back, gap and um, we call this the so-called encounter base. So that's where um, those policies then potentially reach migrants. Of course, um, they might also reach um, as potential migrants at an earlier stage. So even the discourses, for example, um, often filter down to, to potential migrants, um, but the encounter space is where they are meant to um, kind of engage with um, these policies. And um, we argue that encounter consists of three aspects. Um, so first aspect is information, which is the sharing and retrieving of information about migration policies. First of all, that needs to happen. People need to know about them. Um, then there's the interpretation, um, which is the ways in which migrants perceive and interpret information after they've received it. Um, and they might perceive it or interpret it very differently to how it's intended. And then there's the response, what do they do once they've um, kind of evaluated the information. And I now just give um, um, go into these um, three aspects of encounter um, in, a, in slightly more detail and also give some examples for my own research. Um, so first of all, on sharing and retrieval of information. Um, so my own research, but also the research of many other people has shown that information on policies um, doesn't always filter down or it gets lost and um, distorted along the way. Um, so people may have um, limited information on policies, they may have partial or inaccurate information on policies. Um, I also found in my research that um, there are inefficiencies or shortcomings in how um, policies might be communicated and often not shared through channels um, that are used by migrants or, or trusted by migrants. They might be, um, they might also be in languages, for example, that are unfamiliar to so-called target information. Um, and then there's also, of course, always competing information. There's not one source of information, but information coming from different sources. 
Um, and again, these different sources might be more or less trusted. And for example, information campaigns or information coming from, from above or from a, from a foreign donor might be undermined or contested by information that's um, um, quite different and maybe shared by, by someone who's more trusted. And I'll get into that a bit more. Um, also, some of the decision-making literature shows that decisions are often based on, um, I would say, much more informal sources information, so anecdotal information or, or rumors. Um, so once people have information, they need to inter interpret that information. And I think a really key point to make is that, um, and a really important one, I think, to just always remind ourselves as well that people don't just absorb information, they actively engage with it. Um, so they interpret it, they think about it, and they assess that information in relation to their pre pre-existing plans, aspirations, and knowledge. Um, so, and that process is, of course, very, very subjective. Um, they decide which information is relevant or trustworthy. Um, and um, some existing research shows that um, information that confirms existing aspirations and plan is, is the information which is most meaningful to people. Um, I think one aspect that's really important is who shares the information. So who's the source of that information? Um, they actively engage the source um, and trusted information that comes through social networks and personal contacts tends to be valued much more. Um, and um, one other point to make here is that engagements are highly localized in time and space and different information might be prioritized over different points in time or at different points in the migration journey or decision-making process as well. Um, and then responses to information. So once the information has been processed and internalized, um, people need to decide whether to act upon that information, but also what to do, how, how to act upon it. Um, and again, um, people will consider how it relates to their pre-existing aspirations and plans. Um, and because that is a subjective process, um, the, the, again, this kind of, these impacts here could, could be very unexpected. Um, some studies and also my, my own research has shown that people are more likely to respond to positive messaging. So more likely to act upon messages that, um, or policies that incentivize movement that facilitate entry rather than policies that restrict entry. Um, yes, so let me conclude. Um, first of all, I think really important to keep in mind that policy, migration policy is tra transformed as it moves through different stages and the content of policy is also modified by how it's shared and interpreted. Um, I also want to highlight that people are not simply affected, affected by policy, but they actively engage with it and choose how to respond to it. Um, and then I just wanted to say that this is something we will continue looking at in, um, in MIGNEX. So as I mentioned before, we have now pretty much collected data, quantitative and qualitative data, in um, 25 research areas, and there's going to be a lot more research on the links between migration developments. Um, so anything ranging from educational expansion, infrastructure developments, livelihood interventions, social protection interventions, um, and also, of course, <laughs> migration policies and, and migration. Um, and um, well, you can expect first, first um, published findings um, from us next year. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jessica, for this uh, rich presentation. Um, I can warmly recommend everybody to check out the MIGNEX page. They have excellent publications uh, there on this theme. Uh, I will now give the word to Leander. Are you with us, Leander? 
Yes, I'm here. Okay, that's great. So thank you very much. And uh, thanks for the opportunity to be part of this uh, webinar. So good afternoon, good evening to you all, depending on where you are. I must say that I'm glad to be given the opportunity to share some perspectives from the Ghanaian context. So to start with, in contemporary discourses about migration, especially from the global south to the global north, um, assumptions are made about poverty, unemployment, and then conflict as the root causes of migration. And what I will say is, while some or all of these factors might be associated with migration, perspectives on their actual rule differs between origin and then destination countries. So I will start by giving a quick uh, highlight on some of the features of the Ghanaian society that allow us to, or that will allow us to appreciate the policy priorities in Ghana. So like other African countries, Ghana is a very youthful country. And the majority of Ghanaians live in urban areas. Just a few statistics to set the scene. 38.3% uh, of the population was reported to be less than 15 years old in 2010 during the population and housing census. And the majority of this uh, population tends to live in urban areas. So 1960, we had 23.1% of our population in urban centers. That jumped to 43.8% in the year 2000. And then further increased to 50.1% uh, by the year 2010. The projection is that by the year 2025, the urban population will be 63% uh, of the entire Ghanaian population. Now, we know that urbanization serves as a driver of labor emigration, as these young unemployed uh, persons search for economic opportunities, including abroad. And urbanization also increases the likelihood of international migration flows, as people in urban centers tend to have more resources, and then they have stronger social networks that facilitate international migration. So as a country, Ghana is more complex than just reducing it to a source country of irregular migration to Europe. I just give you a, a few um, historical facts about the country. So Ghana has a long history of attracting immigrants, especially from the ECOWAS region to the country. On the one hand, there's a long history also of regular emigration from Ghana since the, 19, the year 1965, when emigration increased due to poor economic uh, performance and then political instability. By the 1990s and then the early to late 2000s, that marked a significant rise in emigration rates, but this time due to economic fortunes of the country. The majority of Ghanaians, however, emigrate to destinations within the West African subregion. So typically, you have West Africa, Europe, and then the United States as the traditional uh, popular destinations for Ghanaian emigrants. However, recent data shows that a substantial flow of migrants, especially of women, tend to move to the Gulf states to work in the informal sector. So on the other hand, Ghana too can be said to be a source country for some irregular migration to destinations including Europe. In addition, it is a country of origin, transit, and then destination for some trafficked uh, victims. We can also say that smuggling Migrant smuggling, which is another form of irregular migration, is associated with uh, Ghana as a country. While a significant proportion of Ghanaians continue to migrate, return migration is equally on an increase due to improvements in the economic performance uh, of the country since the year 2000. So since 2000, different governments in Ghana have implemented several employment generation and welfare uh, programs and these have included the likes of uh, the Skills Training and Employment Placement Program, which is popularly called STEP, National Youth Employment Program, Graduate Entrepreneurial Bus and then Business Support Scheme. You have the Rural Enterprise Program and then the Young Entrepreneurs Program. Uh, recently, we have what we call the Planting for Food and Jobs, One District, One Factory, the National Health Insurance Scheme, and then also free senior high school, free compulsory universal basic education, which is called FQ, and then also livelihood enhancement against poverty. 
These are just a few of the intervention programs that have been put in place by successive governments. And all these are aimed at improving the livelihoods of Ghanaians, but not necessarily to dissuade them from emigrating. So on the contrary, Ghana sees migrants and then the growing diaspora as a development resource that should be harnessed towards socioeconomic development at home. So diaspora engagement through the drafting of a diaspora engagement policy, the right of abode law, the granting of dual citizenship, diaspora homecoming events, the floating of diaspora bonds, and the iconic year of return in 2019 that marked the 400th anniversary of the arrival of uh, the first batch of slaves in America. And now what we call the Beyond the Return Project. These are all seen as development vehicles for Ghana. And they have nothing to do with Europe's obsession with stopping irregular migration from Africa. So in line with Ghana's national prior, uh, priorities, the identification and the promotion of regular pathways for potential migrants has been the country's main focus. And this is manifested in a variety of forms. So in the form of bilateral labor agreements with countries in the Gulf states, the export of nurses to countries like Barbados, and even Germany through the Work Abroad Initiative. And I must say that remittance receipts over time have also been quite substantial. So for instance, in 2015, the country received up to $4.9 billion. And then that amount dropped sharply to $2.98 billion in 2016. But then picked up again to $3.54 billion in 2017, $3 billion in 2018, $3.5 billion in 2019. Within the policy realm, Ghana has drafted the national migration policy, also a national labor migration policy, and then a diaspora engagement policy, which is yet to be approved by cabinet, I must say. Now, if you look at the rationale or the policy or the strategic objectives of these policies, that will help us appreciate where Ghana is, which is totally different from where the EU is. So the rationale for the, labor, the national labor migration policy, for instance, includes the following, to provide comprehensive legislative, regulatory, and institutional frameworks for effective governance of labor migration within and then outside Ghana. Two, to promote decent, and, de decent work and develop mechanisms for enhancing the protection of human and labor rights of migrant workers and then their family members in Ghana and then also in host countries to provide a framework for mainstreaming labor migration issues in national development planning agenda, then to minimize the negative impacts and maximize the benefits of labor migration for migrant workers and then Ghana as a whole. And finally, it says that to facilitate the mobilization of resources for an effective governance of migration for development. Actually, there's even one that says that to also facilitate the production and dissemination of accurate, relevant, and then timely data on labor migration into and then from Ghana. If we shift our focus to the diaspora engagement policy, the draft policy that, has, uh, that is almost ready, it has four strategic objectives. One, to promote capacity building and enhancement of diaspora homeland relations for mutual benefit of both parties, to provide legal instruments and programs that extend some rights and privileges that Ghanaians in Ghana enjoy to their counterparts in the diaspora. And also, thirdly, to strengthen systems for involvement, involving the Ghanaian diaspora in mobilizing resources for sustainable national development. And then finally, to facilitate the production and dissemination of accurate, relevant data on the Ghanaian diaspora in a timely manner to strengthen the homeland's further sustainable engagement with the diaspora. Now, you will appreciate that these priorities are dissimilar from those of the, uh, the EU or Europe in general. So the EU is mainly focused on reduction or stoppage of irregular migration and forced returns. As such, EU funding to, uh, of Ghana's Ministry of the Interior, the Ministry of Employment and Labor Relations, and government departments and agencies, such as the Ghana Immigration Service, the Ghana Police Service has all been laser focused on stopping irregular migration by building the capacity of immigration control uh, agencies, closing porous border crossing points, 
enhancing international cooperation between Ghana on the one hand and her neighbors in the sub-region as in Togo, Burkina Faso, and Cote d'Ivoire to prevent irregular migration and also supporting migration policy formulation and implementation. I must add that the EU also uses surrogates such as IOM, ICMPD, and then development agencies of member, member states like GIZ, uh, GFID, to implement its agenda of curtailing irregular migration. This is mostly done through projects on job creation, return and reintegration, building the capacity of local actors through multi-stakeholder dialogues, provision of logistical support among others. And very concrete examples exist. They include the IOM's uh, Ghana Integrated Migration Management Approach, GIMA project, which was launched in 2014 and then funded by the 10th European uh, Development Fund. And then also the supporting of the setting up of the Migration Management Bureau at the Ghana Immigration Service, also supporting the Minister of Gender, Children and Social Protection and the Ghana Police Service to draft standard operating procedures, SOPs, on fighting human smuggling and then trafficking. And even a later project is also called the Strengthening, Strengthening the Border Security in Ghana Project, which is uh, funded by the EU Trust Fund for Africa and is being implemented by ICMPD with the Ghana Immigration Service. So despite the increase in EU funding initiatives on return and reintegration, Ghana has shown little interest in cooperating with the EU when it comes to forced returns. Such collaborations are perceived within Ghana as the equivalent of political suicide for ruling governments due to an intense media critique of readmission agreements and a very strong lobby by the Ghanaian diaspora against such actions. So to date, we don't have any formal readmission agreements between Ghana and the EU or member states for that matter. So I will simply want to conclude with the following words. By arguing that there is a clear disconnect between the interests of the EU and those of Ghana in the area of migration governance. While Ghana perceives the return of its nationals as in a return migration as potentially helpful to address human capital gaps in the country, Ghana has no interest in forced returns of her nationals abroad, regular or irregular. Since these migrants are collectively perceived as development agents, so far, Ghana has managed to accommodate the injection of EU development funding and capacity and logistical support directly or indirectly aimed at addressing the so-called root causes of migration while fending off any attempts at turning the country into a collaborator in clandestine evictions and impromptu return of Ghanaian irregular migrants. I think I'll, I'll end here and I thank you very much for your attention. I'll be happy to take questions when we get to the question and answer section. Thank you very much. Thank you very, very much, Leander, for this super interesting presentation, bringing some of these uh, contradicting uh, policies, agenda, agendas to the fore. I think this is super important when we discuss these issues. So thank you for that. And uh, now, Oliver, are you with us and ready to go? I'm with you and ready to go. Um, just need to share my screen. So I have a presentation. Okay, so I hope you can see that. Um, thank you. Thank you very much to Ida and uh, Dees for inviting me to this webinar. And uh, it's great to be on this panel and coming off those two presentations, I hope what I'm saying will, will fit well with that. Um, so I'm, the, yeah, in, in the presentation today, I'm just wanted to give, I was asked to give some sort of lessons from the EU Emergency Trust Fund, um, which Leander referred to. My focus is on the Horn of Africa, and I say I don't feel qualified to give lessons from the work of the EU Trust Fund, except for my small part in it, which has been concerned with the research element. Let me just explain, um, what are we talking about with the trust fund? So this trust fund was set up by the EU 
as Leida said, it, with the concern about addressing these root causes of irregular migration of displaced persons in Africa. And uh, there were four pillars of action. And again, this reflects what you've heard from Leanne and Jessica, this focus on great economic and employment opportunities with this idea this stops people moving to, to particularly going on irregular migration, strengthening the resilience of communities, improving migration management, and improved governance and conflict prevention. And in total, it's about been about 5 billion euros have been put into this trust fund, I think since it started in 2016. Um, so you can see some of the agenda of this is it's a money, and I should mention it's development money. So this is coming through what was I, um, uh, Development Cooperation, now known as um, DG uh, in, in, Interpar, International Partnerships. But it's, it's come through development people and it's development, mainly development players who are managing these projects. And I think that's important to emphasize. And I think that might explain some of what Leander was saying about why taking the money from the EU Trust Fund does not necessarily entail um, readmission agreements, because that's not going to be coming through development in the same way. Um, but other, others can probably comment more knowledgeably on that. I've been working in what's been known as a research and evidence facility. It's a research consortium which has been funded by the UTF in the Horn of Africa. And we've been asked to collate and produce, do research which is relevant to the program and the different interventions the UTF is doing, analyzing patterns of migration. And we've also, and the reason what, you know, I've got into this, and I think my colleagues were working as independent, you know, as researchers primarily, we're able, we've been given the space to challenge conventional wisdom and to ask questions about what is going on. And we've tried to take advantage of that. In what follows, I'm going to give two sort of follow on two strands of action that we've done research on, and I give, can give reference to the papers that you can look at afterwards. One strand of research looking at migration management, and another looking at technical and vocational education and training. So one, one side looking at how developed money from the UTF has been used to try and influence migration quite directly. And then you've got another side where you've got development sort of activities being undertaken with a view to shaping migration. And I hope I'll bring out that distinction. I'm rattling through this and I know that there's a lot more that I could say and there's a lot more detail in the reports. That I'll, so um, I apologize if I skate over things too quickly. I should also say I'm speaking on my own behalf here. I'm not speaking on behalf of the REF, and I'm certainly not speaking on behalf of the EUTF. So um, I should make that very clear. So starting with this idea of migration management, and this is you know, it, one of the challenges is trying to work out what does this term mean? You see it throughout the, the migration and development di discourse, and you see a lot of it being discussed in terms of the SDGs, and uh, the Global Compact on Migration, a lot of talk of this notion of migration management. And in terms of action and intervention, it seems to come down to sort of four, four or five key areas of activity. Addressing smuggling and trafficking, so focusing on reducing irregular migration, helping to develop mi migration policies, improving border control and capacity to implement policies, so the capacity building element, enhancing protection of migrants who are vulnerable to abuse, and also quite a large part of it about developing alternative livelihoods and options for those who might be like, most likely to consider irregular movement. So a lot of this, the focus is, tends to be about, if you put it, I put it very bluntly maybe, is, but it's trying to, there's controlling migration, but perhaps more subtly it's about making migration regular. And once it's regular, it's then managed and it's under the control of states. So it's not necessarily, and I think most factors would say, we're not trying to stop migration. We just want to make it regular and safe. 
And what we've done some research on this, um, where we're trying to explore some questions about where does this idea of migration management come from? Who's buying into it? What are the impacts of migration management activities on the lives of migrants and, and others? And what are the impacts of migration management on, on development and how it's playing out in development? I'm not going to try and go into those wordy research questions in any detail. I'll jump straight to the two, two areas we've been looking at in the Horn of Africa. One, we've done research in the field in Basasa and Puntland, Somalia, where it's particularly seen a lot of irregular migrants moving from Ethiopia and Eritrea and some parts of Somalia, looking to get across, the, across to, to Yemen, so heading for, heading for the water. In Ethiopia, we've been looking on the border with Sudan and Matema, and that's a major crossing point for people who are heading through, through Sudan and seen as a part of the route towards Europe um, from, from many EU perspectives. And we were exploring, we were talking to people, not just those who were concerned with migration, but a critical part of the research was, let's talk to people who aren't obsessed with migration. Let's talk to people involved in agriculture. Let's talk to people involved in business. Let's talk to different community groups. And rather than framing our concern about migration, let's understand how different people see migration and what their interests in it are. And this was this generated some interesting results. And I'm just going to give a few, a few um, hints of this. And again, you can see more in the reports. One thing that came for us is that we talk about migration so easily, but what counts as migration? And that isn't always very clear. So particularly in Matema, there's a lot of people crossing that border. But when you talk about migration, people will immediately be thinking about um, migrants heading towards, heading on across into Sudan, up towards Khartoum, and he, you know, so heading well away from the area. The most people who are crossing are they're regular migrants, they're crossing for farm work, they're crossing to do labor, and they're not staying, so they're circular migrants, if you like, as we would say in other parts, but or seasonal migrants. But for many people, when you talked about migration, oh, these are the Saluj, as they were known, they're not migrants. And so who is it we're talking about when we talk about migration it may vary enormously depending who, who we're talking to. They're not migrants, they're people on the move. There are also very different perspectives on the impacts of migration. Um, you know, for some saying, well, the town in Matema, it's a border town, it has to have movement. And there's also a sense, whether it's irregular or not is not the point. We need movement to have the town survive. It's essential. Um, in Puntland, this recognition that Ethiopians, Ethiopians are traveling irregularly, many of them hoping to get across to across the water to Yemen. They spend a long time in the area. They bring a lot of skills in agriculture. They help boost, boost the agricultural production. You have Yemenis who are crossing, some of them as refugees and some, and again, mostly irregular migrants. They're setting up restaurants and yeah, setting up new businesses. So we see that this migration, irregular or not, is good for, for business. But there's also some element of migration which certainly wasn't. And this was, there's a distinction here. So it's not about irregularity or non-irregularity. It's about who's moving and when not. Because in Puntland, particularly, when they see a Somali youths who are heading out and particularly trying to get to your job, this was seen as very problematic. So they weren't interested in the Ethiopians passing through. That wasn't a big deal. And actually that was quite helpful for the town, but they were very concerned about their, losing their youth. And then, but when they're seeing migration management, they're seeing this is not necessarily, it's not addressing the issues they're so concerned about. It's all about dealing with this through flow of people who are seen, you know, Ethiopians and Eritreans who are passing through. And for many of the people in 
for Sasa, that, that wasn't the big concern. So these different views of migration, how far it's framed as a problem, what sort of migration is seen as a problem, and different ideas of migration management, you know, whether it's supporting, you know, support for stranded migration, a lot of efforts back, a lot of people thinking about its information about migration. But I think where it's most important, whether it's about reducing irregular migration, which irregular migration should be coming under my under management, if you like. So it's quite interesting in Basasso, people were saying, they some people were suggesting, well, actually, if we're going to talk about migration management, we should be enabling migrants, particularly that these Ethiopians, give them some status so they can get legal, they can do work legally. They're working, it's beneficial. It's not about stopping them moving. It's not about controlling that movement. It's about, okay, they're here, now it gives them a status. So it's a different view of migration management. Um, I want to point to it, so conclude this bit on this sort of migration management bit. I've only got a few minutes left to talk about some of the critical gaps. It seemed migration management programming seemed to be conceived apart from what I call mainstream development. So it wasn't thinking about agriculture, it wasn't thinking about all the things that need that movement and mobility. The dominant, dominant narrative of migration tended to be around misery, that framed interventions. So irregular migration is a problem. And this focus on regular migration, so we must regularize it and that becomes safe. But irregular migration is essential for the local economy. And I think part of this is the way the SDGs and maybe those of us involved in development have enabled the SDGs to start pointing orderly, safe, regular, and responsible migration and mobility of people. And I think there's some problems there for it because regular migration or irregular migration may actually be very productive for development. And that's the sort of findings we're seeing in this, in this region. And pick that up in discussion then. My last few minutes, I want to turn to um, this tends to use development to influence migration. So draw an example of the study we did on technical and vocational education and training in um, uh, Uganda and Ethiopia. And this is basically and refers, uh, uh, I think uh, Jessica talked a bit about this sort of idea, you improve young people's skills, you reduce the likelihood of irregular migration. But of course, the outcomes are potentially very mixed. Successful uh, training may get someone a job. So they no longer feel they need to move, they no longer want to. Or it may mean they get a job, they get more money, and they're more eager to move, and now they've got money to do it. So jobs fund migration. Unsuccessful training may leave person trained with no employment. They're even more desperate to get out. So increases their ideas of moving, but it may also be it reduces their capacity to move. They have to give up on the idea because they haven't got the income. So it's not very clear that education training will yield migration. So we ask these sort of questions about how far employment and other programs contribute to addressing the aspiration, aspirations and changing people's thinking about whether and how to migrate. Um, just got a couple more slides in my one, one minute left, I think. Um, and what we found was the development impacts on migration were there were some very impressive, seemed very impressive tethered programs. We weren't trying to assess the program, but young people were improving their skills. They were securing jobs. Their living conditions were improved. Participation in training tended to increase the likelihood of migration, certainly internally, especially for capital cities. And particularly for those, we talked to quite a few refugees in Uganda. And, you know, they, they were wanting to take it back to their country of origin, South Sudan. But young people focused on Tevit for livelihoods, not mobility. But in general, success in Tevit seemed to be associated with higher levels of mobility. And some of that's obvious. We know that. Better educated people, people with better skills, they move. There's no big surprise there. But robustly attributed any change in the levels of irregular migration to the delivery of Tevit, that just doesn't seem to be possible. And we couldn't see how, how, that, how you would be able to do that. 
So my final slide is simply to throw up some questions here because um, you know, we asked about using development aid to shape migration. And I think we've got migration management is framed as development aid. And I think that raises important questions about what is meant by development. Is migration management necessarily development? And what are the inconsistencies and contradictions? And secondly, we've got development aid interventions are being given a migration rationale. Something Tevit has always been going on. It's been going on forever as a development program. You wonder whether such programs can meet their migration goals. And are we creating dangers in justifying development funding on the basis of its implication for migration? Because if it doesn't deliver on migration, you might say, well, development isn't working and we, we should be cutting that development funding. So we don't educate people, we don't give vocational training because, oh, if they have that training, they may move. So I think there's some dangers there and perhaps we can pick up some of those in discussion, but I'll stop there, thank you. Thank you so much, Oliver, for bringing us to the Horn of Africa and very concrete also development initiatives. I think it's really, uh, and raises some very interesting questions we can pick up on. Now, Nina Nuba sansen uh, will comment on the three papers and then we will open up for questions also from you and uh, moderated by, by uh, my colleague. Lam. Well, uh, thank you. Thank you, Ida uh, uh, and Dies uh, for letting me comment and, and thank you uh, the three uh, presenters for these uh, wonderful presentations. Uh, um, it's so uh, interesting to see how this research agenda on migration and and development have um, developed over the years and matured and become much more critical uh, than it was when it started out some 20 years ago. So, so thank you for that. Uh, I don't know how much commenting I will do, but I will pose some questions uh, to, to the presenters. I guess I'll pose uh, the questions I have in a row and then you can, um, uh, answer them collectively afterwards or just reflect on them. Um, I was really intrigued uh, uh, about uh, Jessica telling us about uh, how decisions are uh, affected by, by policies um, uh, or if they are um, affected at all. Um, and you also sort of came into the, the range of policy responses that are out there to try to affect uh, migration uh, decisions, the, the root cause approach, uh, those uh, uh, risk uh, information campaigns that are intended to deter migration. Um, and then of course, to stop migration uh, uh, along the way. Then you said actually, but many times non-migration policies uh, are um, main drivers. It's not migration policies that drive, it's other policies. And, and I wonder whether you could elaborate on which uh, more concretely. Um, uh, I'm sure you, you couldn't because of a lack of time. Uh, you also had some very interesting, um, interesting um, observations uh, on the social situations in which um, interpretation of this information about migration takes place. Um, so again, I wonder whether you could give us uh, some uh, examples um, uh, of that. Now, moving on to, um, to uh, Leander Candelige's presentation, and thank you for that. Um, I thought that was very interesting because, uh, first of all, it, 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 it was a pre presentation coming out of what Europeans consider to be a source country. Uh, and, and we got to know that this is a much more uh, complex uh, reality. Uh, uh, various kinds of abilities going on within Ghana, within the region. Um, and involving Ghanaians uh, going to other places, but of which many left many years ago. So what I found 
very interesting in your presentation was these two very different policy levels that the Ghanaian state um, have developed. It seems as if very much by itself, uh, probably inspired by other uh, migrant sending countries, there's been this development of um, diaspora policies that tries to engage Ghanaians abroad and well-established Ghanaians abroad uh, into the national policy by exchange, uh, extending uh, certain rights, uh, etc. Um, and also that a lot of investments uh, are attracted to, to Ghana through, um, through the uh, diaspora. So there is this concrete example of migration actually contributing to combat uh, the root causes uh, by the money flows that what could be called successful Ghanaian migrants contribute to the country. But then you talked about the other part of, 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 of the policy development, uh, the, the current uh, uh, one, which is in migration management, which to me seems to be a process much more steered by foreign interests uh, than necessarily uh, Ghanaian interests. And um, that this policy, even though it's targeted maybe at, at a different uh, community of Ghanaians, um, that that somehow runs counter to some of the, uh, the efforts put into uh, developing uh, the diaspora policy. So I wonder whether you could um, uh, perhaps um, um, uh, develop uh, uh, that a bit, uh, that a bit. Um, yeah. You said one more interesting thing, uh, uh, Leander, that, that I thought maybe all of you can discuss, uh, and that's sort of more from a, a, a migration research interest. You said, well, everybody speaks about this increase in migration, but what we observe is that return migration is also on the increase. And I wonder uh, how that plays out in this uh, political environment of a somehow well-established diaspora uh, politics and uh, now uh, 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 um, a migration policy that perhaps is not really implemented and uh, definitely not fully uh, 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 financed. So what are the obstacles here when, when return migration is also on the increase? Uh, finally, um, uh, uh, I, of course, also enjoyed, as always, uh, Oliver's talk. It's always very um, enlightening and, and the findings from, from the project are really, really interesting. Uh, I mean, whether development money is used for migration uh, prevention purposes is no longer a question. You clearly demonstrate that they are. Uh, how they are used um, is, is still uh, not very clear to the public, I think. So, so thank you for, for giving us some insights uh, to that. Um, so there is this tension between an outside wish to manage migration and then using development aid to influence these migration patterns. Uh, but how effective is it if, as you uh, uh, vividly uh, described, uh, what counts as migration to local actors are totally different uh, uh, from what uh, policymakers and especially northern policymakers or European policymakers uh, tend uh, to think uh, it is. Uh, or is at stake. The critical gaps you you pointed to uh, that migration is conceived apart from 
mainstream development, even though a lot of development lingo is used in, in the migration policy uh, development. Um, so that's the first one. Um, the second, that the dominant narrative that seems sort of to frame, or one could perhaps even say justify, uh, this policy is uh, a dominant narrative of migration leading to misery and maybe speaking less of the misery, the local local misery, I don't know, but maybe you can enlighten us on that. And also this myth that that only um, regular migration is considered safe. And that, of course, uh, during times where regular migration becomes more and more complicated. Um, uh, um. So when you have research, and here comes my question, when you have these research um, results showing uh, these uh, contradictions, critical gaps, uh, uh, etc. How do you get those research findings through to policymakers? And are there different levels here um, uh, so that you might be discussing uh, these issues with Sometimes uh, some types of policymakers, say uh, policymakers within uh, the development area, but that they then have to negotiate this with migration policy uh, makers. So I'm very, very interested in how you, uh, what your experience is with establishing these dialogues and how we all as researchers can get sort of these critical messages true to policymakers and what the obstac uh, obstacles uh, obstacles is, are here so i wonder whether you could uh, maybe elaborate uh, on that uh, apart from that once again thank you for very enlightening and and, and wonderful presentations thank you nina Thank you very much. Uh, very good to have these concrete uh, questions to the very good presentations. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Lars Ingberg Peterson. Now um, I take over from Ida and um, possibly because uh, I come from, from uh, focus on uh, development cooperation. So uh, I will try to, to provide that angle on, on the uh, debate uh, here now. But uh, we also have uh, questions in the Q&A. So, so uh, there are many questions to answer for you now. Uh, I would just like to, to raise one here um, uh, to bridge to the discussion. And that is a little bit more uh, focusing on the uh, uh, development uh, parts. Um, Oliver, you talked about uh, migration management, but also some um, economic and employment activities and so on. Um, Jessica, you talked primarily about migration policies, um, but uh, what we have tried to look at in, in, um, in our work here, um, my, my colleagues Ida and, and uh, Hans and I, uh, is to, the to what extent can we actually find any um, development activities that actually influence the drivers that uh, uh, push people to migrate? Um, the, the nitty gritty drivers, not the root causes as such. Um, while you, Lander, actually talked about the, the root causes to some extent, it, it was, uh, um, you mentioned that, that the general policies that have improved the livelihoods of people have influenced migration patterns at least. So, so, uh, so it's not to say that there is no need for discussing the root causes, but, but uh, we, uh, I would also very much like to hear whether you have come across some examples of, of uh, development activities, concrete development projects that have been able to do something about drivers um, of, of uh, migration. So that's uh, a further angle. And then there are some uh, more questions in the Q&A, which I will try to uh, get in on, on the table as well. But perhaps, um, Jessica, would you like to, to start off by responding a bit to Nina and uh, a bit to the broader development issue uh, on, on the table? Great, yeah, thank you, I'd love to. Um, so I think your question, Lars, is actually a little bit linked to, to Nina's first question around what are the other policy areas that, that influence migration decision-making? 
And I think, so one is the one that, that Oliver already touched upon in his presentation. So TVET, education, um, employment type interventions. Um, and they tend to, um, so I guess we need to um, consider where those interventions are taking place. Um, those interventions can take place in um, the country of origin or maybe a transit country. And then um, often the, the, the aim of those interventions is to, to prevent or stop migration. And last year also asked that any of those interventions successful in stopping migration. Um, and then of course, employment and, and education interventions, but also I guess the economic environment more broadly at the destination country can also influence migration decision-making. Um, so starting with, let's say, origin and transit countries, um, the evidence is emerging, I would say, and um, mixed, but I would say more, well, it depends what kind of interventions you look at. So for example, I recently published a review where we did look at employment and um, TVET and education programs that were explicitly linked to, to um, migration to see um, what on the whole the evidence base says about how they influence migration. And on the whole, um, they don't manage to stop migration. In fact, um, quite a large number of interventions lead to um, increases in migration aspirations and and mobility for, for the reasons which, which Oliver already outlined. Um, having said that, some interventions are, of course, um, more successful. Um, there's also a, another paper I've been working on recently looked at um, the, the links between social protection interventions and, and migration decision making. And the, the evidence base is much more split, also with quite a large number of um, studies actually finding that um, improvements in social protection coverage or access to social protection programs um, leads to decreases in migration aspirations and outflows. Um, and that's, I think, partially because of the design of those policies that they also often have conditions attached to them that are linked to, to movement, um, but, but also because maybe they're potentially a closer substitute to migration, so a way for households to, to manage risks, for example. Um, but again, having said that, there are also studies that find that social protection interventions lead to, to increases in, in, in migration aspirations and, and, and flows because they, for example, can be used to finance migration. Um, in terms of the factors at the destination country that influence migration decision making, there's well many many factors, including social networks, um, historical ties, and all of that. But in terms of policy areas, it's education and labour that tend to be the most important. Um, so my own research, but many other studies, it's often the um, the work environment, the availability of work, um, the the ease of accessing work that that is brought forward as as key factors that influence migration decisions, especially um, regarding particular destinations. So um, that particular de um, decision. Um, um, Nina, you also had um, a question around the interpretation of, of policy and asking me to, to expand on that. Um, so I would say one aspect of that is, um, so, so, so the interpretation of, of policy is, is subjective in a number of different ways. So one is that people assess the source of, um, of the information, as I already mentioned that, that some sources are considered more trustworthy than others. Um, I think there's also growing awareness that um, there's lots of kind of subjective and tangible factors driving decision making and that drive also drive how people interpret um, and, and use information. So that, for example, includes people's um, personality, it includes um, their um, 
Um, it includes things like emotions, feelings, norms, um, and just picking up on, on one idea, it could be around, for example, people's um, risk preferences. Are people very risk averse or are people um, more tolerant of risks? Um, and depending on where, where people sit on that spectrum, um, they um, will interpret information very differently. And for example, um, if, if they are very um, tolerant of risk, they might interpret these information campaigns um, about um, irregular migration um, in a way where they completely disregard that information. So they kind of have tunnel vision on, on their goal and that information is, is completely um, irrelevant to, to them. And they might only pick up on, on, um, on information that kind of confirms um, their, their, their existing plans. Um, I think I'll leave it here um, so that the other speakers can also respond to questions. Yes, thanks. Thanks a lot, Jessica. Leander, um, Nina asked you about uh, policy incoherences um, and also what does uh, return migration mean in the political debates uh, now. Could you also yeah. add an answer to, to an, a more general question that from, from your perspective, if uh, if one wants to get anything positive from the combination of migration and development aid, um, what would you suggest from the experience of Ghana? Do you have something that you think, uh, well, donors or and and um, in their development cooperation, they should focus on something particular? Okay, so thank you very much, Lars, for the opportunity to respond. Uh, first of all, thank you, Nina, for the questions. I'm I'm grateful for that. And it's good that uh, you appreciate the fact that uh, these uh, policies about engaging the diaspora might have been inspired by other nation states uh, that are more well-versed compared to Ghana when it comes to engaging their diaspora. So what sets the Ghana diaspora engagement policy apart is this. So unlike some of the policies that have been drafted by different countries, we have adapted a conceptual framework, which was actually coined by a former schoolmate of mine, Alan Gabney, at the uh, University of Oxford, where we look at a three-part or a three-pronged approach. So first of all, one, linking that symbolic relationship between the diaspora and then the, the home country. But secondly, extending rights to diaspora members before now expecting or extracting obligations from them. So that's that just, uh, by the way, to, uh, to put it in context. Now, the issue of uh, engaging the diaspora and then the remittances that emerge from these type of engagements as against this new narrative about uh, migration management. I can see where you, uh, you can quite easily point out the policy incoherence. So on the one hand, the national migration policy is uh, quite a broad uh, policy that touches on the benefits, including engaging the diaspora and also issues of return migration. But then there are also components that directly conflict these interests by talking about border management and then controls and so on and so forth and human smuggling and then human trafficking. So you have one policy that has internal incoherence where one part of the policy is saying, let's do everything we can to uh, facilitate the movement of nationals and then accrue remittances from their absence and also get them involved in business interests and investment in the uh, home country. Whereas the other part of the policy is saying that let's do everything to clamp down on irregular migration, knowing very well that there are very few pathways to regular migration from countries like Ghana. So I can appreciate that kind of internal contradiction. And even beyond the internal contradiction, you see that the diaspora engagement policy is totally for how to leverage uh, migration for national development, whereas the allied policies are equally being uh, restrictive in nature. And the restrictive nature uh, partly is to do with the funding sources. So the interest of the EU in building capacity is not generic, it's specific to building capacity that enables the restriction of movement or limits the restriction of certain categories of migrants. They are not saying don't move at all, but we want wanted migrants, not unwanted migrants. So that kind of internal selectivity in the migration space is where I think uh, the issue lies. 
And then your question about uh, the development activities, if I can put a finger on uh, maybe a development activity that has had the impact of limiting or reducing migration, is, it is a difficult one because there's a whole lot of uh, policies that are geared towards employment generation, but also just general betterment of the well-being of individuals. And as we appreciate from the migration harm theory, development and then emigration, the way they are linked, as development takes place, at least in the initial to medium term, you expect that emigration should increase. And it only goes down at the extreme end when development has been well established over a period of time. So whilst the development initiatives, whether they are homegrown or supported by external uh, funding, like funding from the EU, whilst they are effective, but in the short term, they are rather driving emigration and not reducing. And I, I suspect that's the disconnect and the lack of appreciation sometimes that leads to uh, nervousness about how much money has been pumped into Africa and there's very little to show for the effect. If anything at all, the funding is working because it's specifically to do that. As you improve people's livelihoods and means of affording international migration, you expect more people to be able to pick it up. But with time, hopefully, the, this, uh, the incentive to migrate, especially using risky and uh, perilous uh, approaches, will reduce if only the EU has uh, the patience uh, and the determination to continue to invest in some of these so-called uh, third or source countries. So I, I will say that if you are a funder and you want to try to manage or to curtail irregular migration, it is okay to continue to invest, but build local capacity in a way that these interventions are uh, part of, it. you need ownership, you need local ownership. This cannot be seen as something that is imposed from the outside. Once you get yourself into that uh, kind of scenario, then forget it because there will be pushbacks. It's good to accept the money, but as to whether the people or governments will deliver on the promises that they made prior to receiving the EU uh, emergency trust funds, that's what is uh, doubtful. So, um, well, let's see how it goes, but I, I think African governments are, are happy to receive the money and the EU should not be too disappointed if in the short term, they are not seeing the intended results. If you stick with it, eventually the results will come. But it needs a lot of patience and collaboration. Thank you. Thank you very much, Leander. Yeah. Just uh, some 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 years of, of patience, something which the politicians don't have much of. Oliver, um, I think um, Nina asked about uh, how do we convey messages uh, from the research world to the policymakers. Um, there is also one question uh, in the Q&A uh, about how come that the politicians haven't understood yet that uh, this is a tricky affair. Um, so so um, it is actually old hat, all the news here. Uh, so so could you also elaborate a little bit on that? And then there are two other uh, important questions, namely one about whether humanitarian aid in particular situations in fragile situations can be of importance uh, with respect to migration, irregular migration. And also uh, the, the distinction between migration um, uh, programs and then uh, development programs um, some NGOs will sometimes try to make resilience or build resilience in communities as a part of uh, either migration management or perhaps development uh, programs. So, so uh, the question, I suppose, goes a little bit whether this distinction is very clear in, in many situations. Again, a whole bunch of questions. Take what you can <laughs> and I'll, try I'll, to answer. I'll, I'll, yeah, I'll, I'll do my best. Um, I think the question Nina asked about yeah, how we communicate is really important because uh, the EU is not, it's not one thing. It's not just communicate to the EU. We know that we're dealing with people in, um, who are concerned primarily in development and they're working on migration issues, but their focus is on development. And um, there's that said, and also they're working in an environment where there's partly dealing with a lot of colleagues, say in DG Home or whatever it is called now, who will have a very different perspective on what's going on with migration. So, and very much our work is focused on what's going on within the continent. We're not particularly looking at migration to Europe. 
within our work um, because that then starts getting into difficult sort of inter-EU inter-commission discussions but of course there's also the question the money you know, there's a game of like we do with research funding when we want to get research funding, we pitch a particular sort of idea of how we're going to, we present a case for the research, but we've got other ideas. And I think in a similar way, you pitch a case where you want to get that development money. You want to use it for good things. And so you are, you, you put a migration spin on. You say, well, we, and you know, if you're going to get this money, you need to focus on an area which is seen as a problematic for out migration say irregular, large areas of uh, irregular migration. So it's changing maybe some of the targeting, it's changing some of, there's an element of spin, but there's also, it, it, that does have concrete effects. So I think it's very communicated. We've got quite an open discussion with the delegations. So, and I think most people, they do know this story that um, Wolfgang in the Q and A referred to. Yeah, it, it's old hat. But actually, the more we can give evidence from the ground to say, look, this is what's going on, that actually helps that discussion and helps people have those discussions. So it's still worth banging on about it, even though it, it's somewhat frustrating, I guess. Um, and then, you know, I think maybe then this is picking up maybe the point you made, Lars, about how do we actually do exploring this link between development and migration? I think one of the problems we've got is that we've come, those of us who are interested in development have started to explore this only when prompted by people who are obsessed by migration. And actually any development activity involves people moving. It's going to have an effect on mobility. It's going to change the way people move if you want to, you know. It, so, but we haven't done any of that analysis in a quite an open way, which needs to be done to understand those micro processes. And if we understood those micro processes without an obsession of root causes of migration and you know, somehow it's got to reduce people's mobility, we would be able to have a much more open analytic analysis and a much more open debate about what's going on as social scientists. And then we'd have something to take to policymakers. Say, look, you need, this, is what's, this is what we understand. But at the moment, we're driven by, we've got to respond to requests to, to, you know, about root causes. And that's, so maybe the last people who'd be looking at this are migration researchers, because they obsess about migration too much. And I think it's understand, it's been people involved in development to understand the role of mobility more broadly. And something that relates to that question about humanitarian aid, being humanitarian aid into, um, in the same way, I'm nervous about giving development a, a, a sort of migration objective. It's even worse with humanitarian response. But there's no doubt that the politics plays, because if it's seen that this is going to have a big the crisis, the emergency is going to potentially generate a lot of refugees, it may have a high profile and it will generate more funds. And it will get a bigger response. And I'm not sure that's, you know, I don't think that's a humanitarian sort of policy in terms of the people on the ground and humanitarian actors are not trying to, but they will be, they will be at responding because the money will go, will follow the migration to some extent, which is quite a depressing story. Thanks a lot. Um... We are. We have six minutes more, <laughs> so um, I would like to give you all three um, panelists uh, a chance to to comment on on these things. And there are uh, additional big questions: one regarding governance and what uh, that means in this connection. Also, with respect to how uh, minorities have a chance to. Uh, yeah, uh, develop and, and live in countries. There's another question about whether it's more uh, useful to look at systematic uh, change uh, rather than uh, different uh, piecemeal interventions. Uh, I suppose that's also the long-term development. And I suppose, Leander, that your, your story from Ghana is actually you know, one about uh, some sort of systematic change. So perhaps you could comment on, on that. 
Um, yes. Uh, those are some of the questions. Uh, I, I can't manage to get them all on board, but um, please, uh, uh, Jessica, um, if you could uh, come with your concluding uh, remarks uh, and cover some of these issues. Okay. Yeah, I was also just giving the, the questions. Um, um, I guess um, one uh, um, one question was um, by, I think, daughter. It was a question about, do we need to kind of take the long-term view on, on this and, um, and, and not try to, to link um, policies directly to, to migration and development and policy making directly to, to migration? I think, um, yes, I think that chimes with all three of our presentations today. Um, I would just, um, I guess, build on what Oliver already said and just um, um, remind everyone that um, fostering development um, doesn't mean that mobility would decrease in a, in a short or even medium term or long term. Um, so Oliver already said that when you do, when you implement development interventions or you um, you you um, grow development, then um, there will be impacts on 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 mobility, and um, there's of course also um, I guess an, um, a macro level link between um, countries' level of development and um, rates of migration from that country. So. Um, Fostering development is, is important um, for its own sake, of course, um, but um, doesn't necessarily lead to a reduction in, in migration out, outflows, as um, some policymakers might hope. Um, I also just, um, I think it was Wolfgang who um, also posed a question around um, kind of the win-win um, policy scenarios that we have around legal legal migration pathways um, and what are the blockages for those? So I'm not not a political scientist, and um, um, I so I yeah I can't really say much beyond the obvious that of course it's it's um, it's politics, it's Brexit, it's um, the perceived perceptions of politicians that um, the general population is not in favor of migration, even though when you do look at surveys, you often find that um, the, the actually the vast majority or a majority in, in most countries is in favor of, of migration. Um, yes, again, so I think running, the, we are sorry. running out of time. So uh, if you could sorry. Conclude. Okay, so I just wanted to say that um, there are now quite a few countries where these um, legal migration pathways in the form of, for example, mobility partnerships are in place. Um, so I think that's something you might want to look into. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jessica. Leander, um, what would you Yes, I, I have very few things. Uh, well, in terms of the time, there's not much, but then just to emphasize the fact that um, regionally, a lot of movement is taking place and lots of attempts are being made at the regional level to improve or to make it easier for people to circulate within the ECOWAS region, for instance. And I think these efforts can be better supported by the EU especially if indirectly the aim is to reduce the number of uh, irregular arrivals rather than picking individual countries and then pitching the, almost pitching them against each other it, it is good for them to negotiate as a block against uh, or to engage with the ECOWAS as a unit rather than picking uh, different countries and then implementing or trying to negotiate deals with the individual countries i think that's part of the confusion and uh, invariably it leads to weaker results rather than strengthening the position of the EU. So that would be my main recommendation to operate at the regional level as much as possible. And also the sense of ownership, that is very critical in policy development and then implementation. There needs to be national ownership of these policies, even if IOM and then the surrogates are going to champion the drafting of the policies, but there needs to be that local content and local commitment by um, academics and then professionals and policy makers of the individual countries. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much, Leander. Yes, and Oliver? Um, I, I think I've got no time at all to say anything. I uh, just maybe responded to that question about migration management uh, since I raised it. Um, about where NGOs distance themselves from migration. I think may at, at times migration management, you know, brought under migration management programs, is concerned with improving access to rights. It is improved with actually improving conditions. So it, it's a the trouble with migration management is the term is so loose and it covers so many things. Um, so I can see why many NGOs don't want to touch it, but perhaps at times they um, there's something of value there. But it's, uh, yeah, it's a, it's a very strange beast, which I think we need to do a lot more critical research on. I, I do think we also think as a developer, someone concerned with development, I really want to question the way we're incorporating migration into the development agenda. Particularly, I, I'm, I personally, I have grave doubts about the way we've incorporated within the SDGs. And I think you know, the way we frame it now as well-managed, orderly, um, regular migration, very much puts it in, in the hands of states rather than the, for the well-being of people who are moving and, and, and others in the society. Thank you very much, Oliver, and thank you to all of you. I think um, some points are quite clear here. Uh, it is clear that development leads to mobility, so so, and they are very much interconnected. So, so thinking that that we can separate them uh, is probably uh, fundamentally wrong. Another thing is that ownership is key for all this. And um, I think also that, that uh, as a, in general, I would agree very much with your point, uh, Oliver, about uh, the problems of how the whole migration agenda has been uh, incorporated in development cooperation, both in, because uh, development practitioners really don't know much about migration and may need to know more about it. Um, another thing is uh, certainly that, that uh, here comes another, yet another uh, objective for development cooperation, which uh, it may not be very useful for a useful tool for. So, uh, so here we have some problems, but also uh, a little bit, uh, a final note on the uh, more positive, uh, constructive line is uh, your suggestion Olivia, of knowing more about the micro processes, um, that we need, need to know more about uh, those processes and see uh, and, and try to understand what is actually going on. Uh, and then we can possibly answer the question whether aid could have some uh, potential impact uh, with respect to those processes. Thank you very much, all of you. It has been a great pleasure to listening to you. And um, we, yeah, we look forward to uh, more results from you, Jessica, uh, in next year. So, so um, but also from, from you, Oliver, and from others who work in, in this field. Thank you very much and goodbye. Thank you.